Hello everyone. Uh, well, thank you for waiting and good morning everyone. Just let me know if uh, you can hear me properly and my screen is visible to you. Just drop yes in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Radha Rajapati. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sally Dhawre, host for today's webinar, and I'm very glad to welcome you all in this webinar, where uh, our goal today is to provide you with actionable knowledge, and we encourage you to participate by asking questions and engage with us throughout the session. Well, now I'd like to introduce you the sponsor of this event, that is Synergetics. Uh, so Synergetics is a learning and cloud-based company uh, who helps organization and professional to enhance their technical capabilities and adapt to evolving digital landscape. Well, here are some uh, master solutions uh, that Synergetics offers. Uh, that is uh, persona based onboarding, uh, onboarding add on, certification solution, certification add on, reskilling, emerging technology training, certification hackathon, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales, pre sales training, practice playbook, and architecting. Well, uh, today's webinar is also organized by emerging technology community, community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. Well, ETC community is open to all who are eager and interested to learn and explore emerging technologies. Well, for uh, to keep yourself updated, you just need to follow us on our Meetup communities. Uh, for that, you just need to download the Meetup app on your system or mobile phone, or you can just scan the code Well, there's a small code of conduct. So please everyone take a note that you can not take the screenshot of this presentation or can't do the screen recording of the webinar. Now, today's speaker for this training is Mr. Mahendra Shinde. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently working with Synergetics as a practice head. And uh, today's agenda is uh, showing on the screen. Also, there is an uh, announcement that upcoming ETT event, ETT webinar details uh, will be posted in the chat box. So interested participants can go and register themselves. Just uh, check the calendar. Well, make sure you follow us on our social media platform just to uh, get daily updates regarding webinars and workshops and more. We have already posted all the social media links in the chat box. Just scroll up or, and you will find the links. Well, thank you for your patience and your hearing me out. And remember, this is not the one way sessions. This is a interactive session and both the parties are responsible uh, to make this session interactive. So now I'd like to hand over this to Mahindra sir. So you can uh, take the charge from here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Saili. So yeah, hi everyone. I hope I'm audible to all of you right now. Hello. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. OK, OK, fine. Thank you. So uh, yeah. So guys, in this particular session, we will talk about GitOps. OK, so. Just a minute, I guess I have not shared my screen yet. Give me a minute. Sharing my screen right away. So I hope my screen is visible, all of you. Yeah, OK. Fine. So this is GitOps. So. GitOps is basically a new trending term 
in uh, DevOps workflows or in uh, a DevOps context, okay? And uh, developers, operations, all type of uh, roles, all type of uh, profiles, people show more interest in using GitOps. So in this particular session, today's session, we will try to understand what exactly is GitOps, how it is related to DevOps, okay? The relation between both DevOps and GitOps and GitOps is a generic term, and there are several implementations of GitOps available. So I will show you one such implementation of GitOps using a tool called Argo CD. Argo CD is one of the many tools available for GitOps implementation. There are others as well. OK, so before we start, I just wanted to know how many of you have worked with any DevOps technology? Anyone? You can use gestures in team or you can raise your hand or you can show thumbs up or something like that, right? Already working on Argo CD. Yeah, that's good. Utkarsh. OK, fine. So anyways, here we will first start with DevOps and then we will go to GitOps to understand exactly how both of them are related. So first module, we will talk about DevOps first. Uh, DevOps, Dev and Ops is a new term. Tekton, Argo CD, and Azure Repos. You have worked with all these. Good, very good. So when we talk about DevOps, uh, we will have to first understand uh, what was need for DevOps. Before DevOps or in traditional development, we had traditional responsibility silos. Responsibility silos means Whenever something happens to your project or whenever it comes to basic thing like delivering a product on time, every one of these job roles like developers, architect, QA, database administrator, they will all have built their own silos and they say like, okay, my responsibilities are or my scope is limited to only these, these and these activities and I will not do anything beyond these scope. So everybody is looking at their own scope. Everybody has their own discipline, right? which actually hinders or which actually creates issues when you need to interact them or when you need to integrate them all together. This is where DevOps will try to break these silos and make sure all these people, whatever type of roles are involved in building software and delivering it to customer, all of them should integrate with each other. All of them should interact with each other. All of them should collaborate and their single a uniform or single, uh, you can say, objective should be delivering a quality product to time, a quality product to customer in time. That should be their single responsibility, single objective. So DevOps is a union of people, process, and product to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. So you might be from QA, you might be from development, or you might be from IT operations team, but DevOps is basically collaboration of all these job roles together. Now, those organizations who adopted DevOps, there was a study conducted in year 2018. It was conducted by DORA, D-O-R-A, uh, that is uh, DevOps Research and Assessment. So as per this particular study, they found those organizations who adopted DevOps, who actually made all the job roles integrate, interact, and collaborate with each other, right? They found their deployment frequency was increased by 46 times, 46 times more deployment frequency. So they were able to deploy application 46 times more. So earlier it used to be like you get the change request from the customer, or maybe you have some created some kind of milestones, right? That we will be deploying application, let's say every three months we'll release it, every six months we release it. DevOps actually help you to release it more frequently. That also translates to another benefit, which is faster time to market. So if you have envisioned something new, or if you are implementing some new functionality, DevOps actually allowed you to take that new functionality or to take the new release to market way faster than earlier times. Seven times lower change failure rate. Any idea what is change failure rate?
yes lower change failure change failure means you try to implement a change and it failed to work and then you have to roll back your application to the older version that is fit, uh, change failure devops also allowed them to lower the change failure rate by seven times lead time to changes there was a great improvement 2500 times faster and all this thing allowed those organizations to increase their revenue now this is impact of devops on those organizations like this particular uh, team they asked few questions to some organizations who transition into devops and what was their project status or how their project used to uh, complete what was their overall efficiency before adopting devops and after adopting devops yeah so this is all good and this is all great about it but what exactly is devops devops as i said is a collaboration collaboration between developers and operations people right Yeah, sorry. So developer and operations. We have what developer responsibilities are. Developer will be responsible for plan first. Plan means basically uh, if you already follow agile methodologies, sprint, scrum, right? So you create a plan for the current iteration, current sprint. You identify what all kind of uh, like what is your current uh, sprint backlog or what is your going to be current iteration plan. Based on that, you implement the thing. After you implement, you build. After you build, you run the unit test. And once the tests are all good, tests are all successfully finished with success, you then release it. Release means you mark that particular product as done, particular functionality as done, or particular sprint as completed, and you hand it over to the operations team. Now, what your operations team will do? Operations team will take that particular release, deploy it in an environment. Now, it could be a dev environment, QA environment, staging environment, and then finally production environment. So your operations team will take the release, deploy it on the server environment, and then operate. Operate means manage that environment. Monitor the application performance. And if everything is fine, then push for the next release. Next release means you have already deployed this particular release on staging, production, environment. Now you start working on the next iteration. For next iteration, again, whatever implementation was scheduled for next iteration, your developer team will start implementing it, build it, test it, release it, and then hand it over to the operations. This is a complete DevOps workflow. Now, those people who have already worked with DevOps, this particular one, do you know what this workflow is called in DevOps and what this workflow is called in DevOps? Let me give you a hint. Both these workflow have one thing common, or you can say a prefix, continuous. Anyone? Hello? Yeah, CI and CD. So this workflow, represents continuous integration and this workflow re represents continuous delivery and deployment now let me tell you one more thing this also requires automation devops actually depends on three different you can say uh, uh, devops has three different important characteristics without which devops is incomplete number one DevOps is a culture. As a culture, DevOps recommend all the team to interact with each other, collaborate with each other. That is first thing, DevOps as a culture. Second thing, DevOps uses automation. DevOps uses automation. Lot of these repetitive tasks must be automated. Like for example, of course, the planning and encoding will be manual, but your build and your test and your release must be automated. Build test release must be automated. Similarly, your deployment, operations, and monitor monitoring 
must be automated as well. The automated workflows are called CI-CD, continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment. So automation is another important, you can say, pillar of DevOps. First one was the culture, DevOps as a culture. Second one was automation, automated workflows. And third one is selecting the right tools to get the thing done. So if you are using something like Azure Pipeline, if you are using GitHub workflows, GitHub Action, if you are using GitLab pipelines, if you are using Jenkins pipeline, that is all tools that you use. And in DevOps, please remember the first priority or first preference is culture. Second, automation. And tools are the third one, last one. Is that clear? So you don't select tools first. You select the CI CD workflows and then select the tool which is more efficient or more, you can say, suitable for your CI CD workflow. If there is a tool which cannot cover your CI CD workflows completely, then don't select that tool. Select the one where you can implement the CI CD workflows uh, properly without any difficulties, without any complexities. So, first, CI CD and then the tool to implement that CI CD. Okay. Any questions so far? Anyone? So these are the workflows, as I said, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous learning and monitoring. Continuous learning and monitoring, I've just added it extra. <coughs> Sorry, what do you do with continuous learning and monitoring is every iteration you learn from previous iterations mistakes, mistakes that you have done in previous iteration. Every time you learn from your previous iteration and you keep on doing improvements. OK, you keep on improving things every iteration that is continuous learning. A typical continuous integration and uh, continuous delivery or continuous deployment workflows, what we are actually doing. OK, so let's say, for example, we have a development team. A development team might be using some kind of source code management tool, SCM. May I know any name of SCM source code management tool that you might be using? Version control system. Anyone? Uh, Git is the version control system. GitHub is a complete DevOps platform. OK, Azure repos. Yes, that, yes, that's right. Azure repo is a version control system. Again, Azure repo is a, you can say, an SCM tool on remote uh, or SCM tool on cloud. The actual version control system that you will use with Azure repo and GitLab is Git. Azure repo and GitLab are basically platforms where you can maintain your remote repositories, OK? Cloud platforms, just like GitHub. Version control system is Git, G-I-T, OK? There are other version control system as well, like you can use SVN, subversion version control system, or you can use, uh, yeah, CLM, OK? There are so many different version control systems already available. So you choose certain version control system depending upon your project requirement. Now, then you use continuous integration, CI. CI, now CI is a workflow. What we do in CI workflow, continuous integration workflow, is every time your developer makes any update to the code, any changes to the code, your continuous integration workflow should automatically build, test, and release your application. Automatically build, test, and release your application. After that, you have continuous deployment workflow. Continuous deployment workflow is the one who will actually take that released application from continuous integration. It will take the application which is released and deploy that application on staging environment, deploy that application on dev and QA environment, and then finally deploy it on production environment. OK. Yeah, you should get the recording uh, once the session is over. Siley will give more information about that at the end, Roshan. Okay, 
So we have staging environment, we have production environment. Many organizations actually use more than two environments, like they might have a dev environment, a QA environment, staging, and then finally production environment. Ideally, now, did you notice that I was using word continuous delivery and deployment or continuous deployment and delivery? Any guess why I'm using two different words here? Continuous delivery and deployment. No. No, no, that's not totally true. Yes, it is automatic, but. Yeah, you mean deployment uh, deployment is manual, right? Abasi? Right there. OK, so that's not the only difference, by the way. When I say continuous deployment, continuous deployment actually means that you are deploying application on certain environment like staging or QA. But continuous delivery. When you do a continuous delivery, delivery means you are actually delivering the product to its rightful users. OK. And by the way, when we release it to the users, that means deploying to production. Normally it should be a manual process. It's because if you do any deployment to a production environment where there might be a previous version of application already up and running. There is a possibility that a previous version of application is already up and running in production and you did a deployment that might actually disrupt or that might actually result in a downtime. So that's why continuous delivery should be a manual process. OK, continuous delivery should be manual process because it might. You know, result in some kind of downtime, right? And it might result in uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, disruptions to the users. OK. <coughs> Sorry. So DevOps actually use this type of workflow CI and CD workflows. OK, a typical CI workflow works like this. In SCM code is updated. You have some kind of CI tools, a continuous integration tool. It could be Azure pipelines. It could be GitHub Actions. It could be Jenkins. It could be GitLab pipeline. So you have some CI tool that will detect a change in code. And as soon as it detects a change in code, it will then use some kind of build tool to automatically build your application. Now that build tool depends on what application programming language you are using. Like Java developers will use Maven or Gradle and uh, Dotnet developers, they will use MS build or VS build, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Tecton pipeline as well. Tecton, sorry. Yes. So there are very different CI tools available. Now, please remember while selecting a CI tool, you will have to first check what kind of application they are actually designed for. So Apasi, what kind of application or what kind of uh, pipeline Tecton provides? Is it specialist into some certain kind of applications? Hello? Yes, microservices, right? Whereas Azure pipeline, GitHub pipelines, GitHub Actions, and uh, Jenkins, they are generic ones. You can use them for any kind of application, microservices or not. You can use them for just anything, right? But modern applications have, you know, kind of a very complex structure. Nowadays, your modern applications might be built with microservice architecture where a single solution might contain 10, 15, 20, 25 different services, right? There is a possibility of all of them are containerized, so you might have to uh, build the container images and then publish those images to certain container registry and then write a workflow to, uh, let's say, deploy them on Kubernetes cluster, all that kind of thing, right? 
So depending upon your application architecture, type of application, technology used, technology stack used, you, you might have to select a certain CI tool, then you have to select a certain build tool, and then you also have to select a certain automated testing tool, right? Do you know even testing has become much automated now? Not just now, okay? Rather, uh, the first thing that was automated in IT industry was testing, right? Automation actually impacted testing a lot, okay? And second thing was, of course, IT administration. Automation, uh, you know, affected that. And now automation is coming in development as well. Anyway, so yeah, test automation. Yes, yeah, that's right. React Native, Node.js, Frontend, better in Azure DevOps, Azure Pipeline, that means, right? Yeah, so open source packages. By the way, Basi, that this is just my personal opinion. Most of these tools like Azure Pipeline and GitHub Actions, they work very well with OSS technologies which are based on Node, right? Yeah. Now, once the test, automated test run, and they they were all successful, you will then prepare a deployable artifact, and this deployable artifact will be then later used by your CD workflow. Continuous delivery and deployment workflow can later use deployable artifact. Now, what about continuous deployment? Now, you will notice one thing. Most of the tools that I told you earlier, like I told you about Azure Pipelines, GitHub Actions, and Jenkins, these are CI tools. Means what they do better is continuous integration, but they also can be extended to perform continuous delivery and deployment. Like Azure Pipeline basically provide two different pipeline types, build pipeline and release pipeline, if you use Azure pipeline. And that release pipeline is actually can be used for CD, continuous delivery and deployment. So what you can do is, you can use your CI CD tool, right? Like Azure pipeline, take the artifact that were prepared by your CI workflow, build artifact, and then use some kind of deployment tool or use some kind of plugin that will actually take that application and deploy it in certain environments. OK, to show you an example, uh, this is how a typical Azure pipeline, Azure release pipeline looks like. I will just show you a small screenshot to explain you how it works like or how people create release pipeline in Azure. So what you can do is, this is how a release pipeline in Azure looks alike. So you have the artifacts built by your previous CI workflow. You took those artifacts, you first deploy them in dev environment, run some test, then you deploy them in QA and staging. Again, you did some test on it, automated test on it, and if they are successful, then you take it from the staging to the production. Did you notice the workflow here? The way the workflow is working. Yeah. So first put it in one environment, then go to another environment, and then finally release it to the production. OK, this is what CD, continuous deployment and delivery, is all about. Why multiple environments? Any reason why you should actually deploy your application first to dev, then to QA, then to staging, and then at the end, you should deploy your application to production. Any reason for that? Any benefit of doing so? Yes, Abbasi, you are right. You can actually give them any name, like instead of saying dev, you can say SIT. Instead of, uh, let's say, QA, you can say UAT, user acceptance test. Instead of staging, you can call them pre-production, and production is always called production environment. But any reason why we should create and maintain four different environments for our application? Any benefit in doing so? Yes, we don't take it directly to production. Why? 
because if our application has any kind of let's say incomplete feature implementation or any kind of bug okay it might crash the already existing application it should not happen that customers come back and complain the previous version was better than this new one we are trying to avoid that right and therefore our application goes through rigorous testing now all these environments are used by some kind of testing only like in dev environment you might actually do a proper system integration test right an integration test to check that all the component of application are properly integrated with each other and they are not having any kind of loose holes loopholes then you have a qa environment where you will perform some additional automated testing unit test is done in ci pipeline integration uh, pipeline okay and uh, you can even do some kind of load test stress test right system penetration test and so on okay staging environment is used when your application is simply parked there pre production environment or staging is used to park your application before it goes to production but you can also use it for running some kind of test yeah that's right security test in uat right that would be the qa environment okay application will be in staging environment for some time right this could be used for performance test like load test stress test etc and once everything is done you take it to production this to ensure you are releasing a quality product to your customer there should be no compromise on product quality and guess what now this is a best example i told you devops is all about three things culture automation and tools now this is why you need automation guess what if you do this without automation if you are not using automation if you are not using continuous delivery and deployment workflows cd workflows there are organizations which were using traditional ways to maintain these four environments and deploy their application from one environment to other and guess what they used to take a lot of time to move your application from dev to qa qa to staging and staging to production so it used to happen like environment was or uh, developer has already finished building it 3 months back and for last 3 month application is simply slowly moving from the dev to qa qa to staging and after 3 month it finally goes to production that's the manual approach right devops workflow like cd allows you to automate it and by automating it you can speed up the things releases can be canary or blue green yes that's right there are multiple different re release patterns you can use and that is possible because you have already automated it we are getting my point already everything is faster it's automated like from dev it automatically goes to qa from qa it automatically goes to staging so now we can try patterns like canary pattern or blue green pattern Okay. Other than Abbasi, anybody else know what is Canary and Blue Green deployment pattern? Anyone else? Okay. Blue Green is when you are actually providing two options to users. Oh, sorry, not two options. That is AB deployment. In blue and green deployment, it means that you have old version of application already in, let's say. green environment and you release a new version of application in blue right and then you swap them group blue becomes green green becomes blue users can access the application now but if any kind of defect is found in production you can just swap them again right you can roll back the deployment easily and canary is like the new features will be released only for selected users not to everyone okay so you can do that yes you can do that to better manage your product updates so this is optional this comes later okay oh sorry i need to minimize this so that is cd workflow now these are some of the tools that you might use like for example if you are building a java application the build tool java application uses is maven and gradle 
If you are a .NET developer, you will use something like MS Build Visual Studio Build. If you are a Python developer, you might use something like PIP, which is Python Package Manager basically, and NPM, Node Package Manager. For testing, you will use tools like JUnit, TestNG, NUnit, PyTest, Mocha, and so on. And in Build Agent, you can build them on multiple platform. Now, just a small correction. If you are using .NET Core, C-O-R-E, .NET Core, .NET Core can be built on both Linux and Windows. Here I have mentioned Windows. That's wrong, actually. Uh, only if it is .NET Classic legacy version, it requires Windows. But .NET Core, you can run it anywhere now. Okay, Java, Python, Node.js, you can use any kind of either Linux or Windows platform both. Additional tools you might need to know. You might use something like Azure DevOps, which is very good CI CD tool with complete ALM and available as a service SaaS, that is Jenkins CI CD, but does not provide application life management, lifecycle management, and it is available as a community free version man and managed service. Circle CI, it's again CI CD, but no ALM available as a managed service. Web deploy, it's not a CI CD tool, just a deployment plugin. FTP deploy, again a plugin. Any question about these tools? And I just wanted to know how many of you have used some of the tools I have explained or I have uh, pointed here in this presentation, this slide. How many of you have used at least one or two tools from this slide? OK, so Utkarsh has used. Good. Yeah. Used Git. Yeah, Git is a very bare minimum requirement for using DevOps. By the way, uh, before you start working on DevOps, you have to start using certain version control system, not just Git, but any other version control system for that matter. To get started with DevOps. OK, just a minute. Okay. Fine. Used Git as your DevOps and GitLab. Yeah, that's great. Now, so DevOps has benefits for everyone, developers, testers, and operations. For developers, you can you get automation and build and integration. You get continuous integration and continuous feedback. What is continuous feedback? Continuous feedback means at every phase, you get a feedback from the automated tool, whatever changes you made recently, whether those changes worked or they failed, you get a feedback immediately. Okay. For testers, there is a continuous testing, automated testers, and then we have continuous feedback. It provides better integration with the testing tools. It also makes sure that your testing environment is properly set up. You get test bait set up properly through automation and you can collaborate with developers. For operations, on the other hand, you get continuous monitoring, continuous feedback, and it ensures you get identical environments everywhere. So if your application works in dev, it has to work in QA, it has to work in staging, and it has to work in production as well. Why? Because all the environments were identical. Please remember there is one more part of DevOps, which I did not uh, mention here in presentation earlier, uh, which is called infrastructure as a code. Yes, GitOps controller does that. We are moving on this this point now in very few minutes. OK. Yeah. So this is all about DevOps now. OK, we will skip that GitHub part. 
GitHub is not required. GitHub is just one DevOps platform I have uh, given here as an example. Let's talk about GitOps, OK? Uh, because you may or may not need GitHub here. What exactly is GitOps now? What we have discussed so far is only about DevOps as a generic term, DevOps as a generic concept. Let's talk about GitOps. What exactly is GitOps and what exactly GitOps is not? GitOps is continuous deployment for cloud native applications. What do you mean by cloud native applications, by the way? Anyone? Path? Yes, due to security policies, GitHub is also blocked. Now that is organization to organization. OK. Yeah. Usually those organizations who block GitHub, they use some alternative like either Azure pipelines or they might use GitLab. And that too, GitLab installed in their on-premise server instead of accessing GitLab from uh, cloud service. Anybody using any such configuration? Uh, Parth has mentioned apps built to be deployed on cloud. On premise, you have used it, right? OK, good. So most of those organizations who block GitHub, they block it because they are already using an alternative which is in-house. They are using an in-house alternative for that, right? Uh, GitHub also is available for on premise deployment. We call it GitHub Enterprise. OK, yeah. So cloud native applications are applications which are born to be deployed on cloud. Applications which actually will consume or applications that will actually get all the benefits of cloud. And these applications may or may not work properly on on premise cloud native applications. Now cloud native applications have different kind of demands or different kind of character characteristics than your regular applications. And they also need a new and modern way to release and deploy them on cloud. If you are using something like Azure Pipeline, GitHub Actions, they are for generic all kind of application. Whereas GitOps is continuous deployment for the cloud native applications, specific type of applications. So what exactly GitOps is and why it start with Git? Please remember, GitOps like DevOps, in DevOps we have Dev and Operations team, but in GitOps we have Git and Operations. Right. So far, developers say that Git is a developer tool. Usually, developers say that Git is a developer tool. We use Git for maintaining our source code, but Git is not just for application source code. Interesting thing is you can now use Git version control system or Git repositories to maintain or to keep your entire infrastructure inside it. To keep your entire infrastructure declaration or infrastructure template inside it. To give you an example, I will take you to my uh, Azure Quick Start templates, which is basically a Git repository on GitHub. But this is Azure Quick Start template. This contains not the source code, but instead a deployment template. Right? So to show you an example now, I'll go to application workload. From application workload, I'll go for, uh, let's say, Jenkins. Yeah, Jenkins. From Jenkins, I'll go with this Jenkins cluster, two Linux and one Windows, right? And uh, this one you will notice here it is. This is the cluster. This is some of the readme file declaration. OK, uh, so I guess some three years back, I created this template using as your uh, ARM templates, ARM templates, JSON template. I deployed it on as your quick start template and they got uh, accepted, but unfortunately I did not work on this particular template for last two years. Okay, 
that's why many of the tests has failed because I did not update this uh, template with today's standard. Anyways, so this is it. You will notice this is all I have created. This is the template. This is ARM template, but is ARM only any kind uh, only type of a template? No, there are a lot many other types of templates we can use. This is called declarative approach. What is it called? A declarative approach. This ARM template. Yes, this is called IAC infrastructure as a code, right? Because this template will create virtual machines. Are you getting my point? If you use this particular template, it will create three virtual machines. Right, but can we do similar thing for application as well? Now let me show you something related to applications. No, there is no Kubernetes deployment file here. Let me take you directly to my Kubernetes uh, manifest files. Okay. To show you an example, let's take this one. For example, this is a YAML file, and you will notice one thing. The single YAML file is actually going to deploy three different applications. First one is web app one. Second one is web app two. And third one is web app three. So I have three different applications in a single YAML file. And then for all the three applications, we have three services also declared. This is again declarative approach, but this time it is not for infrastructure. It is for application. Are you getting my point? So Git can be used for application and infrastructure both. Right, and this time it does not contain source code. Now both these repositories. OK, so this time I'm using it for two different purpose. Here I'm using it for application and in quick start template. I'm using it for infrastructure. So Git repositories are no longer only used for your source code. You can use them. Right, these are applications set in Kubernetes and OpenShift. That's right. OK, so we can use them for non source code or non application repositories as well. So you can use a declarative infrastructure infra as a code and you can use it for application deployment configuration as well. And what is GitOps now? In GitOps, we can use GitOps in this way. Every time. Every time somebody makes changes to these template, there is a workflow which will automatically scan them, automatically run through them, automatically test them, and it will show you a result. Like for example, I created this template some three years back, right? Okay, and then I did not make any changes to it. And then some other user made some changes to this template. I did not work on it for quite some time, right? And now it is giving us lot of lot of test fail errors. So you will notice in the readme file here, there are these flags with several test failed. If I click on any of these buttons, that will actually take me to this response. OK, they are not actually showing me the current workflow. For the exact workflow, I have to log in into my GitHub account and show you what exactly happened uh, to them. OK, OK, so I'll just show you some of the. Full request here. So this was the pull request I created. As you can see, I created this particular template in year 2020, so four years back, right? 
and you will notice the kind of interaction I did. And let me show you this. OK, the workflows, it actually hide. It is actually hiding all the workflow execution and instead it is just showing me the uh, interaction that happened between Brian and me with about this particular uh, workflow. He suggested several changes to the workflow uh, before it was accepted. Before it was accepted. Yeah, I can check this one. The verified ones. OK, but it is expired. It's old one, right? So the workflows will have some kind of automated pipelines to automatically scan, automatically test them. And if everything is fine, only then it will goes to deployment. Similarly, if I make any changes to my Kubernetes YAML file, my application configuration file, every time I make a new commit, it should automatically detect the change and redeploy my entire application. This is what GitOps is. Is that clear? Hello? So any change you make to your either infrastructure as a code configuration, any change you make to your infrastructure infrastructure configuration or application configuration, as soon as you make the change, certain automated workflows will get triggered and they will deliver those changes in real environment or to real application. That is GitOps. That is GitOps. But then how it is different than continuous delivery and deployment workflows? How it is different than continuous delivery and continuous deployment workflows? Yes, Abbasi has already mentioned the right answer for it. Anybody else? OK, so basically a regular approach if you use. If you use a regular or you can say a classic CD workflows, continuous delivery deployment workflows, you can trigger continuous deployment. You can trigger CD workflows or continuous deployment workflows three ways. Number one, you can manually invoke them, manual run. Number two, every time a new release is created, or every time your CD workflow, CI workflow creates a new work, new artifact, publishes a new release artifact or new build artifact, whatever you call it, then automatically your CD workflow will run. And number three, it's scheduled deployment. What is scheduled deployment? A regular or classic CD workflows, continuous delivery deployment workflows, you invoke them either manually or every time your CI workflow creates new artifact, new version, you call CD workflow. Or you can schedule it like every Saturday, every Friday. Right? But how GitOps is different now? What is GitOps? How it is different? In case of GitOps, GitOps automatically Keep syncing, it sync like Abasi has mentioned, sync the manifest or config files in Git repository with the actual environment. Now, environment means you can actually use it for all the environment. You can have GitOps workflow for production environment, and you can also have GitOps workflow to work in dev, test, staging. QA and then production environment, all of them, whichever is target environment. So what GitOps will do? GitOps will sync your configuration file or manifest with the actual environment. And if they are not in sync, if they are not in sync, then they will make sure they update the environment to match it with the configuration found in Git repository. So instead of using Git repository only for the application source code, now you can have a dedicated Git repository that contains 
infrastructure as a code, your infrastructure configuration or your application manifest files. Now, this is most commonly used for containerized workflows. It is most commonly used for containerized workflows. Is that clear? Any question about this? GitOps? Yes, now that is about individual tool. OK, now GitOps is a generic concept and there are a lot many different tools. Came up, they said, OK, we will provide you GitOps or we will provide you implementation of GitOps. Argo CD is just one of them, basically. So what is key principle of GitOps? Number one, declarative description. Never use any kind of script or manual approach to create your environment, set up your environment. It must be declarative. Do you know there are third party tools also available to set up your environment? Basically cloud environment. How many of you have used Terraform? Heard about Terraform? Yes. Anyone? Sneha. Good. So Sneha, Terraform is Park has also raised his hand. Right. Good. So Terraform is an infrastructure automation tool, or rather, IAC, infrastructure as a code tool, where you can define your entire infrastructure in Terraform template file and then ask Terraform CLI to set up the environment from that template. Right? So one of the key principle of GitOps is everything must be declarable. Uh, Ansible is actually a configuration management tool, Apache. Ansible is configuration management tool, but now it has so many different plugins available, so many different plugins available that you can extend it. You can extend Ansible to work like an infrastructure automation tool as well. Like for example, Ansible now has a plugin for Azure ARM. OK, that that can be used to make Ansible deploy Azure resources. From Ansible playbooks. OK, you can provision your Azure virtual machines from Ansible. I do remember uh, last time I had to set up a lab environment for some 40 people, 40 participants, and I used Ansible to deploy them, right? And uh, while deploying the lab, initially the requirement that I received was to use uh, to, uh, to have JDK installed on all the machines. I installed JDK 11 using Ansible playbook. I installed JDK 11 in all the 40 virtual machines for zero. Uh, and then. The environment was launched and then I got a change requirement. The change requirement was they said, Mahindra, we don't need an, uh, JDK 11. What we actually need is JDK 8. OK, you know what I did? I I just edited that. Uh, I just opened that Ansible uh, playbook in my VS code, went to that particular uh, yeah, particular configuration file, right? Playbook file. And there I changed JDK version from 11 to 8, saved it, right? run Ansible command line to apply the changes, right? And I told them I'm working on it. Give me 10 minutes. That's it. And in next 10 minutes, all the machines had JDK 8 installed. And I had designed my Ansible playbook to make sure that currently installed JDK, JDK 8 automatically becomes the default JDK, Java home environment variable and everything I had said. That is example of automation. Now tell me one thing. What if I did do this manually, like SSH into every Ubuntu machine or RDP into every Ubuntu machine, manually install JDK 8 into it and make sure that is default JDK. Don't you think for 40 machines it might have taken me two hours, right? Or maybe more than that? Hello? Yes? 
Uh, but in that example, I did not use Ansible for IAC. I used Ansible for configuration management. Okay. Anyways, you can use it for both the activities now. But remember, Ansible is for configuration management and Terraform is for infrastructure as a code, IAC basically. Anyways, so there are so many different tools available in there. And similar to those tools, GitOps also says that define everything in some document, maybe a YAML document, JSON document, whatever you might be using. Use a declar declarative language to define everything. Number two, version and immutable. What do you mean by version and immutable? Immutable means your infrastructure must not be modified. Immutable means once you deploy, you don't make any change. But we do make change, right? Sometimes when I put these two words together, version and immutable, people actually get confused because versioning means maintaining multiple version of the same artifact. Is that clear? Hello? Hello? Versioning means maintaining multiple version or multiple copies of the same artifact. And immutability means no modification. Don't you think they are opposite to each other? Hello? Anyone? Yes, they are kind of opposite, but we are using them in a same context. What does it mean? Whenever you release your application, right? It should be immutable. Your environment must be immutable. That means you should not make any manual change in that environment. Whenever you want to make a change, there is a process to be followed. To make any change, the change must be introduced as a new version. The change must be introduced as a new version of configuration. And then push that new version of configuration to your environment. That will give you one huge benefit. You can track all the changes. That gives you traceability. What is traceability? You will get to know like what changes were made to your infrastructure when and how, who made those changes. And because everything is tracked, if at all it is needed to undo your last changes, you can undo those changes by going back or reverting back to the older version. And that's why GitOps use Git version control system. Yes, because Git version control system provides you that feature versioning. Rather, now this might be actually going little bit out of scope, but I normally personally refer to Git as a concept or a tool that provides time traveling. What is time traveling? It actually let you go back to your older code or your older version. In Git, it might be possible that you made several changes to your code, nothing worked, and you were like, okay, I gave up. Let's go back to the code which I have written on January 1st. That was the original one without any bug, without any problem. Since then, I was trying to do some research. I was trying to implement something new that didn't work. Now let me go back to the old one, which was up and running with no issues, no worries. You can do that with Git. And here in GitOps, we get that benefit of version control system, Git. Number three, pulled automatically. Now this is because Git has lots of Git hooks or GitHub hooks if you use GitHub. So you can automate this process, automatically pull the changes. It's very easy. Whatever GitOps tool you use, the GitOps tool will simply go and ask your Git repository, what is your latest commit ID? What is your latest commit ID? And if that commit ID matches with the last commit ID, that means there were no changes made to the Git repository. But if the commit ID is different, if your current commit ID and your last commit ID are not same, that means you must have made some changes to it. Right? Yes, Git closed. So they will check if your commit ID has changed. If your last commit ID is different than what it was recorded in the system earlier, that means certain changes have been made. Download the changes, deploy them. So it will be pulled automatically. 
And you can also do continuous reconciliation. You can reconcile that my environment was like this earlier, and now my environment is like this. You can always do this. It's called Git diff. If you are using Git repository or Git version control system, in Git version control system, it is called Git diff. Like for example, Oh, wait a second. No, not this one actually. OK, to show you an example here, this is my sample Java application and in the sample Java application, I have created some Kubernetes manifest for the application. So for entire application, there is Kubernetes manifest created. And if I go to a particular manifest here, this manifest is updated six months back. If I click on this particular commit ID, it will show me or, or I want to see the history of commit changes. I have made several changes to this. Now what if I randomly select one change, click on it, and it will actually show me what changes I have done. Like for example, the change I have done here in this commit, there are few changes here. Like for example, okay, this is minor. I have just uh, kind of uh, deleted an extra space here. And here I have added an IP address. No, IP address was first. I had an IP address, static IP address. I removed it so that system can automatically take assign any IP address for it. Now this is kind of an easy, you can say uh, uh, reconciliation. You can reconcile the things like it was like this earlier and now it is like this. You can find the differences or compare it, compare it like this. OK, so like for, for example, earlier I was using config map reference and now I'm using secret reference. Notice that. What all changes I have done. By the way, I'm not actually following the best practice, which normally I prefer or in most of my session I tell about, uh, I, I, I normally uh, recommend a best practice to people. I, I tell them whenever you are using Git, okay, don't put multiple unrelated changes into one single commit. And I'm actually breaking that best practice now. In the same commit, I have modified Docker file, I have modified Docker Compose file, and I have also modified Kubernetes artifact file. There should be three to four different commit IDs here. OK, anyways, that's fine. You can say it's like an anti pattern. Yeah, secure hash also can be used for every commit ID. That commit ID itself is a secure hash you call. OK, it's a globally unique ID. OK, that can be used to compare if there is a new commit. Now, this is the same application I'm going to use for GitOps now. Why? Because this application already has the required Kubernetes artifacts here. This one. Here it is. All Kubernetes artifacts are already present. OK. So let's get back here. So I was explaining you these terms, the four important terms here, like GitOps declarative description, your infrastructure and application are described declaratively. Typically, not always, but most of the time, YAML files. Version and immutable. They are version, that means every change is recorded as a new version and then immutable. You don't make any changes directly to it. If you want to make a change, you have to introduce a new version. And then what it does? It replaces the old version with new version on infrastructure. That means it will tear down the old infrastructure and set up a new one. Pulled automatically, it's because it will check with Git for any new commit. And if a new commit is detected, do the uh, fresh, uh, you can say, update. And if there is no new commit found, it means it's not required. Continuous reconciliation, it will keep compare the environment. Now, this is what actually I told you about in pull automatically. It will check what is the state defined in Git repository and what is the actual state. So these are key principles of GitOps. Benefits. 
increase deployment speed like devops gitops increase the deployment speed for your application because it automates and accelerate deployment process make it faster to get changes in production enhanced stability and reliability stability is increased because it reduces error because of automation and declarative configuration amount of errors will be reduced and you get a consistent environment what do you mean by consistent environment in case if you are maintaining four environments dev staging qa and production and if you are using infrastructure as a code iac for them it will ensure that all the four environments are in consistency or all the four environments are in sync with each other it should not happen that your dev environment is using java open jdk from uh, let's say eclipse and your production environment is using oracle jdk it will not happen why because they both are based on the same template collaboration will be improved it facilitates a better collaboration by using git version control features it enables team members to track changes propose updates right because of git basically you can also use existing features of git something like pull request anybody heard about git pull request hello heard about pull request Pull request is basically a way you can do code review in GitHub. So basically, using pull request, you make some changes to the code, you raise a pull request, and you request collaborators or other team members to evaluate your code and accept it. Like this. Like I told you earlier. My pull request. And here, let me show you some of my pull request now. Like this is another template I created in January 2023, and this was the pull request. You will notice a kind of interaction happened between me and another person who was evaluating my pull request. OK, so like, for example, I did some update here, right? Because syntax was there was some uh, uh, best practices not followed and all right. And finally, I changed the title and there was a user Alex who actually accepted the changes and merged them in this particular Git repository. Now there were three people involved here. One is a bot as your quick start bot. Then this person who accepted my request collaborator and this one is me. Right. OK. So the pull request provides you a better way to interact with the team. OK, that gives you a traceability. You will always have a record of what changes were done by which developer, which user and whether they were accepted or not. It improves the collaboration and then auditability. That is what traceability is. Every change is logged. Every change is traceable. You can always know who made what changes to that particular repository. Is that clear? It provides a kind of an audit trail. Provides a kind of audit trail. You can also create a different uh, folders for all those environment like uh, uh, like you have mentioned. Abasi has mentioned different uh, folder for dev, SIT, UAT and production, right? That's possible. Or you can create new branch for them. OK, dev branch production branch and so on. So proper workflow is like this. Developer commit the code. CI pipeline will build. Then it will merge the changes to the main branch. Merging changes to the main branch will trigger the CD pipeline. OK, and the CD pipeline deployment workflow will then monitor and reconcile. That means it will check whatever you have made changes to the uh, uh, CD uh, state or uh, deployment state. It will verify that with the actual environment. And if it is not in sync, deploy it, sync it. What kind of tool do we use? Now, these are the GitOps tools. Now, 
In the GitOps stool, the first one here is Argo CD. Argo CD is a very tiny and very simple tool to use. That's why I have selected it as a primary tool for our, this today's session, Argo CD. Argo CD is a declarative GitOps continuous delivery tool for Kubernetes. It can be deployed right there in the same Kubernetes cluster where you are deploying your application. Or in case if you have a Kubernetes fleet, fleet means you have multiple clusters. You can have Argo CD installed in one Kubernetes cluster and the applications deployed on another cluster. That is also possible. Many, part, many a times in production, people use that setup. Then you have Flux CD, which is another GitOps tool to automate Kubernetes deployment. If you want another one based on Jenkins, there is something called Jenkins X. Jenkins X is another open source CI solution, CI CD solution, again, native for Kubernetes, built on Kubernetes. And then finally, Tekton. Tekton, a flexible Kubernetes native open, CI, open source CI CD framework. So you have choice of any one of these four tools, and they all have few things common in them. What is common in all of them? They all are GitOps tool. They all need Kubernetes cluster. You can deploy them inside a Kubernetes cluster. OK, and then you can configure your application to work directly. Or you can set up a CI CD pipeline for your application directly in those tools like Argo CD, for example. We already have one person who have used at least two tools out of this. Right, Abbasi, you have used Argo and Tekton both, right? Right. Under the root ACM. Good, that's good. So basically these tools are GitOps tool. Now, let's talk about how do we use them? A basic setup for them. You need to first have Git installed. That is prerequisite. Number two, you need to have a Kubernetes cluster also set up. You need both a Git repository and a Kubernetes cluster. Then you choose which kind of Kubernetes, uh, sorry, which kind of GitOps tool you are planning to use. You can use a GitOps tool like Argo CD, Flux, or Jenkins X, whatever you might want to choose. Choose the GitOps tool. Define your applications declarative configuration and then connect your Git repository to the given cluster. That's how it set. It is set up. I'm using right now local Docker desktop Kubernetes and I will have to check if my Kubernetes is up and running. If not, I will have to deploy Kubernetes somewhere, maybe on cloud. Looks like my Kubernetes is taking extremely longer time to uh, kind of uh, start. Right, there is something wrong with my Kubernetes, local Kubernetes, unfortunately. But uh, don't worry, I have multiple uh, uh, other solutions as well. I could have Kubernetes cluster deployed on cloud quite easily, isn't it? Yeah, Tekton can be used for both CI and CD. So one benefit would be you can simply have the source code repository and you can use Tekton to basically build and deploy your application from the same workflow. Wait a second, looks like I entered the wrong password. Anyway, I will do this. Meanwhile, I'll close this. Docker desktop is of no use to me. I should just shut it down. And instead, what I'll do is I will instead use AKS as your Kubernetes service, which is basically just a, you can say, a, a container cluster or Kubernetes cluster on cloud, a managed Kubernetes cluster, basically. This should not take much time, okay? Deploying Kubernetes cluster on it, uh, Azure should not take much time, just another two, three minutes. Meanwhile, you have any questions, please post your questions on a chat window now.
okay, some time it will take for Kubernetes cluster to be ready, AKS cluster to be ready. Uh, it's going to take some time. Wait a second, where it is? Yeah. So this will take some time. Meanwhile, we'll discuss a few more points here. So in order to use any of those tools, Argo CD or Tekton, for example, you need to have your Git repository, you need to have your Kubernetes cluster, and you need to choose a GitOps tool of your choice. Now, a demo with Argo CD. We will, I will show you a demo, and then we will uh, just have small discussion about what we did exactly. Okay, I will show you our actual demo for uh, Argo CD now, and then we'll wind up today's session. Okay, so how do we install Argo CD? To install Argo CD, what you can basically do is you can just uh, visit their website and download Argo CD CLI for your website. Okay, Tekton can be used. Is there any free AI automation tool to migrate YAML uh, from Azure pipeline to Tekton pipeline? Uh, good question. Actually, I'm using quite few AI tools, but I never used any AI tool to do this type of translation. Okay, I'm not sure about any tool can do that, but why not, right? I have something called GitHub uh, a Copilot available installed on my system, and I'm, I'm I, I, I can just simply try that, right? Probably. This is a sample application I have, and I'm not sure whether it has any Azure pipeline inside it. No, there is no Azure pipeline. This is basically just a deployment template. But why not we just try this from. Let's ask question to this tool. OK, I have a tool installed called uh, GitHub Copilot. OK. Sorry, yeah, I'll just say, uh, can you translate as your pipeline? Wait a second. Can you translate as your pipeline? to own pipeline. OK. Yes, looks like if you use GitHub Copilot, you can do this. Yeah, right. There is no free tool as such, but what you can do is, uh, yeah, I guess I did a typo here, Tekton. They have just given us a example here, right? So if this is your Azure pipeline, Tekton pipeline here would be like this. So looks like it's doable. Uh, unfortunately, GitHub Copilot is not completely free. You have to actually subscribe for a 30 days trial. Okay, and then it will start a monthly uh, payment uh, of $10 or $19, depending upon pricing plan. But it's doable if you have this type of. AI tool. Unfortunately, free AI tool like uh, ChatGPT, I'm not sure whether it is possible. OK. No, it's manual. Manual means you have to raise a question and ask uh, uh, GitHub Copilot to translate that for you. OK. Yeah. Fine. So back to the demo. Let me check if my Kubernetes cluster is ready now. So looks like Cluster would be ready in just a few minutes. OK. Yeah, it's running. Let's connect this particular cluster and uh, wait a second. Here it is. So I will quickly connect this particular cluster to my current uh, PowerShell in my local machine. Yeah. 
right? So what I'll do now is let's go to my user home directory and then I'll go to queue folder and let me just kind of back up my old Kubernetes config file. OK, and let's do this now. Uh, don't worry, I already have Azure CLI installed, so I will just set the account and I will download the cluster credentials. But I guess I might need some change here. Force it to give me admin credentials. OK, that's it. Now my Kubernetes cluster is accessible to me after the credentials are downloaded, of course. Looks like done. Now what I'll do now is I'll use this command. Sorry, not git. I'll use this command. Kubectl. Sorry, kubectl config and get context. So looks like I'm connected to my Kubernetes cluster now. Now we have to install Argo CD. So how do we install Argo CD? I guess on this machine, I already have Argo CD installed somewhere. What is it? Argo CD is just a binary file. You just have to download this binary file and keep it somewhere in your local folder. Like for example, what I have done is I have created a common folder for Helm and all the binaries are stored here. You can see Argo CD is already there. OK, the CLI is already there. By the way, in case if you want to know how to download it or from where to download it, you can just head over to Argo CD uh, community page. Here it is. OK, argoproject.github.io. OK, now this is Argo CD. What you can do is basically you can download the binary file. This is documentation for Argo basically. OK, and uh, if you want to get it. You can actually get Argo CD using manifest file also, and there is another way is to download the exe file of Argo CD. What I have done is I have downloaded the exe for Argo CD directly. I already have the exe file, so I don't need this. This exe is already in my path variable. So let's try Argo CD and let's just take a help from Argo CD. So if I do Argo CD help, this is the complete help. Now here, Argo CD allows me to, uh, you know, interact with my cluster. OK, so for example, you can say Argo CD account, Argo CD admin. Right, Argo CD GPG project repo version, etc. No cluster I cannot use. I already have the cluster and. Uh, OK, looks like inside a Kubernetes cluster, it's better if I create a separate namespace to keep Argo CD. So I will create a separate namespace called Argo CD namespace. And once I have created Argo CD namespace, I have to download and install Argo CD on it using the manifest file only. There is no option available in CLI. So what I will do is. I will just use this command. OK, let's copy this and paste it here. And this will install Argo CD in its own namespace Argo CD. Right, so this should install Argo CD right there inside my Kubernetes cluster. OK, so looks like it has done everything. Let's verify. All from namespace 
Argo CD. So let's see what all things are there in Argo CD namespace. So you can see Argo CD namespace has all these pods, but most of them are not yet ready. You can see its status is zero out of one. These are the services. These are the uh, deployment objects, and these are the replica set. And there is even one, sta one stateful set. Let's try the status once again. OK, looks like out of uh, seven, eight pods, just two pods have shown status as zero out of one. Others are already up and running. That's great. Let's try again. Did you notice all the pods are running now? Hello? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means Argo CD is ready to use. Let's get the default password of Argo CD. Let me show you here. This is how you get the default password for Argo CD. Your default password is Argo CD initial admin secret from Argo CD namespace. We will take the password and display it on the screen. So this is the password for Argo CD. OK, uh, looks like this is an encoded one. This password here is base64 encoded. How do we decode it back? Unfortunately, for uh, base64 encode decode, uh, what I will do is. Uh, uh, I will use tool base64 decode, and here I will just pass this. String. And then use base64 hyphen D to get the password. So this is my actual password for Argo CD. Yes, I got the password. Now, next what? Let's use Argo CD login. Wait a second. I cannot log in if it is not already connected, right? Let's try it anyways. Yeah, there is a decode tool, but it is available in uh, our default Linux bash. I'm not sure if, if there is a decode tool available for PowerShell. Right now I'm using PowerShell. OK, this is my PowerShell environment. OK, we need to provide the server URL. Yeah, that's right. So let's do one thing. I will have. One more, probably a command prompt here. And here I will just try to uh, run Argo CD from this, uh, this command, for example. kubectl port forward svc Argo, Argo CD server from namespace Argo CD, and let's run it on port 8080. OK, so now my Argo CD service is available on localhost port 8080. Now from there, I can now access Argo CD like this. Argo CD login and here the server will be localhost 8080. Let's see if I'm able to log in now. Looks like it's saying there is a warning that uh, it's not able to uh, process the TLS certificate because right now I'm using insecure certificates, self-signed certificates. So let's just accept it. It's asking for the user login. Now what is the default user login for Argo CD? The default login ID for Argo CD is. Argo. Oh, sorry, I guess it's add me and then I will paste the password and let's press enter. Looks like something is wrong. Either username or password is wrong. So I installed it. Then I did the CLI. After CLI, I did port forwarding. I did login. Argo CD admin. Initial password I can get from here. Argo CD server. There is another way to get the password. OK, that's the same password basically. 
And in order to log in, wait a second. Let's try to log in using the web user interface. Okay, same thing. Click on advanced. This is because we are using self sign certificate. Accept the sign in risk. Now it's asking for the username and the password. Okay. I'll go in password. Sign in. Not now. Okay, default username should be admin, not algo. And password should be the initial password which I entered. Yeah, this is right. Okay, so this is a Argo CD user interface. Instead of logging in from CLI, you can also log in from uh, admin user. No, admin one, two, three, four will not work because there is an initial password automatically generated unless you don't update it from the CLI. So looks, looks like my Argo CD is up and running and it's all good. Right now, if I want to, let's say, deploy anything, I can deploy my application. I can create my application from here. There is a create application button. You can provide application details here. Now you have two options. Either you can do it from the CLI or you can do it from web user interface. OK, so you can create application. You can provide project name. Let's say default project and my application name is my app. Then sync policy you can define whether it should be automatic or manual. You can also set the delete finalizer to properly delete the application whenever required. You can also provide some more options like prune last, auto create namespace, etc. Let's say I used auto create namespace. And what should be the uh, prune propagancy? Do it on foreground or background. You can also say that resource will be replace. Let's say replace is the default option. So it will use replace create command, which is destructive command because it will delete the old instance and try a new one. So that's why the warning. Then you have to provide your repository URL. So like for example, remember I, I told you this is a sample application I'm going to use now. Spring rest Docker Compose. And in this repository, there is a KTS deployment folder. And inside KTS deployment folder, all the YAML artifacts are already there. Now, you will also notice one thing that image name here mentions image name Mahindra Shinde API app. Now, to tell you frankly, I already have this image deployed on Docker Hub. It's already there on Docker Hub. Okay, this is my Docker Hub account. And inside this Docker Hub account, you will see my API app is already there. Sorry, here it should be, right? I already have this API app here, right? I created this some. Oh, oh, sorry, not this one. Yeah. API app. This one. No, not this one. API app, this one. This was created some four years ago. I guess it requires serious updates. Anyway, should work just fine. So I'm going to use my repository here. And OK, so let's get the repository URL from this loan panel. And I will copy paste this repository URL here. So this is the repository to get head branches. You don't have to specify the branch name here. OK, so that's fine. And now the path. Now, very important thing. Without path, it will actually assume that your Kubernetes manifest are right there in the root of this particular repository. But that's not the thing. In this particular repository, there is a folder, and this folder contains my Kubernetes manifest. So let me write the folder path. So now Argo CD will check for this particular folder, KTS deployment. Now, cluster URL. You will notice the cluster URL. There is already a value propagated 
Kubernetes default SVC. Now, this is because it means that I want Argo CD to deploy my application on same Kubernetes cluster where Argo CD itself is running. And then let's say I want to create everything in a special namespace called dev. Now there is also an option to basically just, you know, create the dev namespace before you do this. To prevent any kind of uh, errors in future, let's say I want to create a namespace called dev. Okay, so namespace dev is already created. kubectl get all from namespace dev. So you can see here namespace dev has no resources found. So here I wrote dev namespace and everything is fine now. Let's create the application. Application is created. Wait for it. Looks like the status of application is missing and out of sync. What do you mean by missing? Any guess? What do you mean by missing and out of sync? Argo CD is a declarative tool. It is trying to check whether similar application is already there. If not, it says missing. So what I'll do, I'll click a sync button. Let us sync it. OK. And I want all these things, synchronized resource. My application has these many Kubernetes, uh, you can say, manifest. And I want all of that synchronized. OK, let's see what happens now. Looks like status is sync, but it is not completely done uh, the deployment. Meanwhile, I will go back here and rerun this command and suddenly can you see here all the deployments actually happening? Pods are all ready and Argo CD is actually showing me the status. It says that my application status is synced OK, so whatever YAML files I have and whatever real application I have in my Kubernetes cluster, they both are in sync. Last sync was done to this. Now, any guess what is this 4FF819C? 4FF819C, any idea? This is the commit ID. Remember I told you that these tools, what they basically do is they check what is your last commit ID. Did you notice what is last commit ID on GitHub? It is 4FF819C and my Argo CD is also saying, showing the same thing. That means if I create a new commit, if at all if I create a new commit on my Git repository, it will detect the change and sync it. Is that clear? Yes, it will detect the change and sync it immediately. OK, anyway, my application is now healthy, I guess. Uh, looks like there is some issue with my application deployment. However, I can redeploy it. You can see there is a button here. OK, my database is already healthy and my services are healthy. My DB config is also up and running, but there is some issue with my application, I guess. Let's check the events. So you can see the complete log of events. What has happened? You have to start from bottom. Like this is when the admin user was created, and this is the latest one, application health reporting. Application health reporting is the latest one. Is there any issue with this? Let's find more. You can even check the logs. Now this is the log generated by application and did you notice a log here? Something interesting. Hello. Notice something. Is it saying Hibernate dialect not set? That means there is some kind of runtime exception in my application and due to that my application is not working fine. OK, so. I guess for this I have to modify one of the YAML files here. So let's do one thing. Uh, this is the app deployment. And for this app deployment, what if I just add one environment variable to provide the Hibernate dialect to it? Possible, right? Let's do that from VS uh, uh, from the GitHub itself. So this is my app container. And inside the app container, let me create a new environment variable. The environment variable would be Hibernate 
dialect. Oh, wait a second. Dialect is it DIA or DAA? D -A -I? D -A -I. Yeah, so whatever I've written is correct. Hibernate dialect and value would be MySQL. Right? Oh, wait a second. How should I write Hibernate dialect here? Spring JPA. Hypernet dialect for MySQL. I guess it requires a fully qualified name or something. So uh, usually you should write something like this. OK, this should be the correct dialect name. So let me update this now. OK, so by introducing this environment variable here, right? I, I guess it should fix the issue now. Now let me do a commit. Now what I'm just doing here is making a commit in my version control system or making a commit directly to my Git repository. After I make a commit, you will notice that now the latest commit ID is no longer that 411. It's now changed. It's 359. So let's go back to this. Let's go back to this uh, uh, Argo CD application. And for Argo CD application now, what I will do is I'll just sync it again. Unfortunately, I did not set it for auto sync. I set it for manual sync. Let's do the sync again. Now you will notice the head ID here has changed. Did you notice the commit ID changed? Change in commit ID. Notice that? You can see this is the last sync. OK, the sync is already done. It's progressing now. And let's see the progress, what progress it is doing right now. This one five minutes ago. Looks like I should manually deploy it now. No, this is DB. DB should work just fine. The issue was with the application. So oh, application is healthy now. That's good. I'm not sure why database is showing so so much time. Okay, looks like there is a new entry now. DP and app both are progressing. OK, fine. We just have to wait for these two things to work properly. Uh, the database logs we can check access the log. So looks like uh, OK, database also has some issues now. I guess my application requires some serious updates. Notice this MySQL has unknown option dash dash. OK, fine. So probably I have to rebuild the containers to make this work. Anyway, did you understand how it works now? Yes, you are right, Abbasi. You can, I can just uh, set some kind of readiness probe to verify that. And those probes will go inside your Kubernetes manifest files itself. Here it should be. Okay. Like in database, there should be a readiness probe. Unfortunately, I did not put any kind of probes in there. So this is how Argo CD, one of the very commonly used C, uh, or GitOps tool, will take your application and deploy it on Kubernetes directly. It can detect the changes that you make to the Git repository, and every time you make changes to Git repository, it will update those changes, sync them, and update them. Yeah, that was the end of our demo. Any question, any queries about this demo? Anyone? No. OK, so there are certain best practices when using GitOps. Number one, you should keep manifest simple and modular. It's far better to create multiple manifest file instead of creating one single manifest for all. Automate everything. All the tasks must be already automated. Don't use manual step like I was using manual sync, but you should use auto sync. OK, use manual sync for production. OK, then uh, monitor and alerts. You can set up a monitoring and alerting in case some issues are caught. And you should regularly audit and review your application, your source code, your Git repositories, and so on. Is that clear, everyone? Hello?
So that's the end of GitOps session now. Any questions you have, any queries you have about overall GitOps, you can put your questions here in a chat window now. Anyone, any questions? Any questions, any queries, anyone? So uh, Sneha no. has raised uh, her hand. Uh, if you allow, we can unmute her and uh, ask if she has any Yeah, questions. yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, Sneha, you can unmute if you have any questions. Sneha, do you have any questions? Uh, Sneha, you can ask your question here. You can unmute yourself and ask question if you have any. OK, so I will assume you don't have any questions and you are just acknowledging to the question I asked, right? Anyone, anybody, anybody who has a questions, there are two options. You people can either unmute yourself and ask question over a mic or you can put your question in a chat window. OK, I will remain online. I'll remain uh, logged in into this for another uh, couple of minutes. OK. Uh, so Siley, I guess you can take over if they do not have any questions. And meanwhile, if any question is posted here on the chat window, I will respond to it. OK. OK, so well, thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge and for practicals you have done. Uh, well, Abbasi, do you have any questions or queries uh, while you have raised your hand? Uh, sir, Abbasi, you have questions. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I guess we can. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm going to unmute you now. Hello. And uh, Full demo. Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. You're okay, Michael. Now. Yeah. Yeah, it was a wonderful demo uh, and uh, yeah, so my question is uh, uh, related to, uh, you know, which team needs to have an access to the Argo CD, right? So it's basically the deployment team and the release team, right? Uh, yes, yes. So, so the deployment comes first uh, as to, you know, like uh, who are the people who are going to, who are the teams or who are the people in the team who are going to deploy uh the uh, you know the application right uh, yes, second yes. is the release so what about the mm -hmm. release part where can we monitor uh, like uh, we discussed the canary uh, you know update and the blue green right, right. Uh, deployment right, right. Uh, so how do we see that uh, you know like uh, uh, can we see that as a, uh, in a single dashboard uh, because i believe argo cd doesn't uh, show uh, you know, like uh, how the the you know it changes from the uh, the the green changes to the blue and blue changes to the green, right? So that version, right, right. while it is upgrading, it, it's not shown there, right? So how do we right, see right. this one? You know. Okay. Okay. So basically, and, and who all who all yeah. stakeholders needs to have a visibility, uh, you know, in the Argo CD, like apart from the right. deployment guys, apart from the release guys, who who all can monitor it? Yes, so basically uh, this is now opinion based answer. OK, this is whatever I'm going to share with you. It's just my opinion about it. Industry expert might have different opinion on it. My opinion is you should keep your CI pipeline, your CI workflow totally separate and your CD workflow separate. Your CI workflow, you can use tools like Jenkins as your pipeline. 
GitHub Actions or any other CI tool of your choice. Now, what this CI tool should do, the CI tool should detect the code changes and publish your container images to some private container registry. Private container registry. This is one thing. OK, now second thing they should do are from your CI pipeline. You should do two changes. Number one, upload new images. Or upload or I guess better word is publish images. To private container registry and also there will be a different. Uh, you can say repository, a separate repository you will maintain for deployment artifacts. OK, or let's say for the. Uh, Argo CD. Deployment manifest, you can maintain a multi different, uh, you can say, source code repository. Now, here, developer from CI workflow should make changes to the deployment manifest. So, how it should be modified? Inside your deployment file, ideally, instead of this type of deployment file, wait a second. Instead of creating a deployment file like this, you should have a deployment file with a placeholder. Like here, instead of image name, there should be a placeholder. And what you should do from your CI workflow, CI workflow from Jenkins or GitHub, you update that with actual value, right? Or you just write a code that will first upload the uh, private container registry, publish the image to container registry, and update image tags or image name in your deployment artifact, deployment manifest. That means the developers need access to your CI and access to your deployment manifest as well. Is that clear? Hello? Yeah, th yeah that's clear. So right. yeah, so now, uh, we are using Argo CD, so the CI, uh, yes. sorry, we are using the Azure, Azure repo, so the developers have access to the, you know, the, the all the manifest uh, which are, there in the different folders, like only developers can see the dev SIT, not the UAT and the, you know, the, yes, the product. That's right. right. UAT and production, rather, another of my personal view is that you can have two Kubernetes clusters, one yeah. Kubernetes cluster, one Kubernetes cluster for dev and QA environment. Exactly. Okay? This is how it is. Right. Yes. So, we yes. Have so one clusters, is, different yes. namespaces for the physical yes. cluster. Right. So what you can do is a single cluster with two namespaces, dev and QA. Now, yeah. when you deploy Argo CD here, sorry, let's use a different uh, tool. Let's say Argo CD deployed here will be configured to auto sync everything. Auto sync means this will actually synchronize all the changes in deployment manifest directly to dev and QA. There is no manual intervention required. So. As soon as your CI workflow updates this and this, this particular Argo CD should automatically sync both dev and QA environments like that. Is that clear? Yeah, Hello? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? We are doing this. Uh, and another okay. thing is uh, related to the image registry. Uh, so we are using a Red Hat QA. Uh, and right. uh, we are publishing the images uh, as soon as the CI pipeline creates the image. Uh, the image right. is getting pushed to the image registry, uh, the Red Hat QA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, but but how yes. does it help me with the Argo CD? Uh, so I'm not clear because uh, pushing the image in the image registry has nothing to do mm -hmm. with the Argo CD process, right? No, as no, we... that, that's not required. So basically, yeah. I'll, I'll explain you the concept here a little bit. Uh, right now I'm using these images from Docker Hub. Notice that? Yeah. Right. Now I will also show you something interesting about my Kubernetes cluster, my AKS cluster. Are you using AKS by any chance? Yes. Yes, we are using. Okay. Then what you can do in AKS cluster, you can sync. We use or AKS can as well. Cluster we as use well AKS as well as OpenShift, both. OpenShift as well. Fine. Then do you know that? In general Kubernetes and in AKS, you can link your Kubernetes cluster with a container registry directly. Let me yes. show you somewhere here. You will find this. So. Uh, OK, I can't see it directly from here now, but let me check if it is possible in properties. No, uh, this particular uh, 
Kubernetes cluster is already sync with my container registry. OK, my container registry, which I have uh, connected on Azure. That way. This particular Kubernetes cluster will have direct access to that particular is uh, elastic, not elastic, sorry, Azure uh, container registry. ACR is already linked with this. Yeah, this Kubernetes cluster is already linked with my ACR. As your Kubernetes, uh, as your container registry. I guess we can't see it from here once it is connected. Yeah, so in the OpenShift side also, it uh, does the same. Like uh, the ACP. OpenShift uh, right. cluster uh, right. will uh, have uh, one uh, in the if you if you see in the console uh, in the cluster the namespace, it will show uh, you know the connection to the uh, Quay registry. Is right. uh, our yes. internal registry. So yeah. that way, that way, you don't have to do anything, anything in Argo. Argo will yes. simply take your Kubernetes manifest and push them to Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes need to have connectivity with your container registry. Now, there are two Correct. ways you can do that, like this access, or you can also have Kubernetes manifest to include. I can show it from Kubernetes docs. You can also have something called registry secret. You could have registry secrets pre-created in your Kubernetes cluster. So what is benefit of that? Somewhere in your manifest itself, you have to refer to the secrets of registry. Wait yes. a second, right? So that way, Argo CD do not care whether you have access to the registry or not. Argo CD will simply take the manifest, push them to Kubernetes API server. Now Kubernetes will take care how to... Uh, wait a second. You can also do this. You can create a Docker secret. You can link it with image pool service. You can even add it to the service account itself. Notice this service account is a user or service account is an identity that you create under Kubernetes RBAC. Correct. Right? Yes. And yeah. then if you add it to the service account, then you don't have to even mention anywhere in any uh, Kubernetes manifest file. Yes, Are you getting so we point? can directly we can directly connect to the registry if we have set this uh, secret uh, right. and uh, uh, the manifest will be fetched from there. Uh, so Argo City yes. will run the sync against uh, the manifest yes. uh, which are there yes. in the in the registry itself, right? Yeah, see Argo City requires connectivity and authentication for only two services. One is your Git repository and another yes. is your Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Yes. Now, if you are maintaining Kubernetes fleet, fleet means collection of several Kubernetes cluster, you can have a separate operator cluster for Kubernetes where you have uh, Argo CD installed and your target Kubernetes cluster can be outside, but then you have to make sure Argo CD has access to those clusters, but then you have to create a special Kubernetes config file that will allow Argo CD to access a particular Kubernetes cluster. That would be an additional headache. Additional, uh, yeah. you can say. So we are setting up uh, Argo CD instance on each of the Kubernetes cluster. You know, OpenShift okay. basically. Okay, okay. OpenShift is better actually. OpenShift is basically extension of Kubernetes. Correct. So it's a namespace. So logical separation mm -hmm. is all namespace for the physical okay. cluster. Good. And Good. then we can but, set up the Argo yeah. CD for each of the yes, but, each of them. Right. But then ideally, you should also make sure that your other Kubernetes administrators are not given access to your Argo CD namespace. Hide them yes. or provide a custom rule uh, binding to, you know, not allow them to modify anything in Argo CD namespace. And also make sure that resource quotas are created so that Argo CD will always get fixed amount of resources allocated to it. No compromise because if your Argo yeah. CD namespace, if your pods get ejected, the entire synchronization process will be impacted due to that. Okay. Correct. Yes. Limits so and the quotas. Else? We have to set right. both. Yes. 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 You have to set the resource quotas and you have to set the RBAC for role yes. access. Okay. Yeah. Anything else, anyone? Venisha, Yusuf, Sir? Umesh. Yeah. Sir. Saili? Oh, I have a question. Hello, sir. Neha. Okay. Oh. Yes, Neha. Uh, sir, so I want to ask what is the difference between all those GitHub tools like Argo CD, Flex, and all? Okay, all these are competitors basically. Like, for example, 
I don't. I gave you a demo of Argo CD, but there is also another one like a Flex Flux Flux CD, for example. The difference here is now this difference is already available on multiple different uh, uh, portals. Like for example, wait a second. I don't like text. Okay, there is no much information available here, but basically they are two different competitors. The way they work is both same, but let's see the articles. There are multiple articles available. You just have to say, say this versus this. The way they deliver application, the way they manage configuration and so on. Is so any like any example, particular service so means any particular service they provide is different from other tools. Is there like that? Yeah, there are some differences. Like for example, Flux is one who's providing immutable infrastructure and blue green deployment, which is built into it. You can see it here, right? Argo CD, okay. on the other hand, okay. one of the major benefit of Argo CD is must multi cluster management. Multi cluster management means huh. Argo CD in production is always deployed like this. You create a separate Kubernetes cluster, a master cluster. And you install Argo CD on that cluster. And Argo CD will then deploy your application to the other clusters. Right? This is one of the okay. uh, benefit of Argo CD. Whereas Flux is auto always deployed in the same cluster where you are deploying things. Flux has built-in support for oh. clean blue green deployment, as you can see here. So there is an article. I'll share the link here with you. These are the differences here. So one, and if you, yes. One, and one more thing uh, that I, actually I'm looking for a job in DevOps. So is there is how uh, how many teams are there working in a DevOps? A DevOps team, it is totally flexible. Like uh, depending upon project and number of components you have in project, now size of your DevOps team will be different. Okay. So basically, it depends like, on how many tools they are using. Accordingly, no, their it's team. Not it's not tool because in DevOps we use normally lots of tools, right? Right. Now, what okay. normally people do is, if it is a monolith, it's no. Generally, it's not monolith, but it could be a distributed application with front end, back end, or maybe two or three tier application, or it might be a microservice. In DevOps, generally. There is a separate team, dedicated team for each module. Like there will be a front end developers, back end developers, database administrators. Or if there is a microservice architecture, then each microservice will have a, will have a dedicated team like that. Ideally, in DevOps, one team's size should be around three to five people. If it is, yeah, it would be then mono, modular monolith. Basi, you are right. We don't have any more any regular monolith anymore. Most of the monoliths, most of the applications which are not microservices are modular monolithic. Modular monolith means we just split them into multiple team, but it is still single application. Right. Back to your question, Sneha. So team side generally, now this is a best practice. Three to five people in one team. Now one team means they are building either front end or back end, or they are building one microservice at a time. But overall entire project might have three, four or even 10 different teams. Depending upon complexity of the project, you might even have a dedicated ops team for your project, operations team for your project. OK. Fine. Okay. And if you are okay. starting DevOps, yeah. right, you should first start with mm -hmm. version control system. Then you should go to CI CD and the Argo CD or GitOps should be the last option for you. GitOps should be the last technology. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Fine. So GitOps is a part of DevOps only, right? Yeah, GitOps is part of DevOps, but it is more focused on the delivery aspect, not the build aspect. It is simply okay. assuming that you already have application built with CI pipeline. Okay, means if we consider that uh, 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 stage of uh, from delivering uh, from developing to deployment. Uh, yeah. GitOps comes after Kubernetes, right? GitOps come after, yeah, after Kubernetes. Yes, that's right. Because it assumes okay. that you already have Kubernetes cluster set up and you already have application built 
in two images. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. I got it. Yeah. And so, uh, what's and uh, where comes that Prometheus and Grafana? They comes for monitoring Prometheus purpose only. Prometheus and Grafana are monitoring tools. Prometheus and Grafana okay. are monitoring tools. So, like Abasi has asked a question, like how do I monitor, right? So basically, okay. GitOps tools are just operations tool. You you still need a monitoring stack. So probably you will install some kind of uh, monitoring stack, like most commonly one that I have used earlier was Prometheus plus Grafana. Prometheus will collect the information and Grafana will present it on a nice dashboard. Getting okay. my point? So yes, what sir. is and benefit? Benefit okay. would be you will be able to monitor all the workloads in one single place if you have deployed it like that. OK, and uh, so that uh, uh, GitOps tools can be used uh, means it is used for uh, like you know, what's a uh, taste, taste environment or direct production environment. All, all environments. GitOps is for all. Ideally, you should okay. first deploy your application to dev and test dev and QA and then move it to staging and production. You never okay, directly correct. jump to production, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's a very nice webinar. I attended your earlier webinar also. That was very also nice. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Okay, guys, I guess uh, that's it for now. Uh, if you are already a member of our community, you can uh, you will get more information about upcoming session on there, like this one, for example. Okay, provide your feedback. There is a feedback a link provided here, and uh, Archie has mentioned some badges which are available to all of you. There is a link already shared. Uh, redeem those badges uh, because in your Microsoft Learn profile, it can appear as one of your learning achievements, right? So use the link provided here and thank you very much for joining the session and have a good day. Thank you.